So first off, thanks everyone for coming. As Matt said, my name is Kevin Harris, and I'm going to talk you through how the company I work for, Innova, we did more of an evolutionary approach to DevOps. So first off, a little bit of background about myself. I'm currently a system engineer team lead at Innova. I've been doing systems for over 10 years now, long enough to be doing it back when they called us sysadmins. I've been building platforms and tools that help get applications and technologies out the door so we can actually solve business needs. I've done this for universities, startups, enterprises, so I've done every kind of DevOps transformation from non-existent to rapid rabbit changes back and forth to kind of more freighter kind of directed changes. So a little bit about Innova, the company I work for. We're an online lending company that's publicly traded. All that goes to say is we are highly regulated and have lots of compliance issues we have to deal with. We also have about 1,200 employees, 300 of which are technology and analytics engineers with six distinct products that we offer. We're hosted in both AWS and in our own data centers. Yes, we still have our own data centers. These are primarily written in Ruby and Go, and the company is about 15 years old. Why am I telling you this? This all goes into why uh, Nova made a more kind of slow freighter evolutionary approach to how we did our DevOps transformation, and are still are. So what do I mean when I talk about an evolutionary approach to DevOps? Really, what is that? So we all know change is going to happen at any company we're at. And that change can come by fast, rapid, or sometimes it can be more slow-paced and frustrating and hair-pulling when you can't see the iteration and the rate that you're wanting to go. So really, what we had to look at was as we wanted to involve and embrace more of these DevOps features, technologies, principles, how can we evolve those into our company and make our company faster to deliver products to our customers? So we really wanted to focus on improving our ease to launch new technologies, new services, new ideas, and also at the, main at the same time, improve our happiness of both our engineers that are building those new technologies and engineers that work with me on my team that have to support, help get those out the door, make sure the infrastructure is stable and running. So it's a combination of both making sure things can get out the door fast, but also stable and make sure we're doing it in a, in a scalable fashion. But at the same time, we wanted to minimize risk to both our customers, our developers and engineers inside, and make sure we're doing things that keep us compliant and we're not having any kind of regulatory issues. While also disrupting the impact we have on our engineers as they're doing those day-to-day -day things because some things have hard deadlines of we have to make sure we're meeting this compliance regulation by this date, and if we don't, we can't do business. So we had to balance both that risk and that disruption while we were looking to make these changes. So that's why we did a more methodological kind of targeted approach as we're going, th going out the door instead of the big bang approach where a C-level from top down sends a memo that says, hey, we're doing this today, and if you don't agree, the door's over there. We did a more, let's survey our landscape, let's see what's out there, how can we go and fix that? Of course, as we were going along this journey, we failed lots of times. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you that our journey was perfect. No one's journey is going to be perfect. The key thing from those failures is learning from them and understanding what we can do better. So I'm here today to share kind of five key lessons we learned through failures on our journey so hopefully you don't run into those same failures. So lesson one. The first lesson revolves around how we actually figured out who was going to kind of spearhead this first wave of our DevOps transformation. So that revolves around what kind of teams, who's going to do that. And of course, we started with a thing a lot of people do and then usually change off. We had the DevOps team. They're going to come in and they're going to do the DevOps. They're going to DevOps all the things. Didn't really work out so well. That just ended up being a catch-all for engineers that didn't fit on other teams, or scopes or projects. Teams were like, oh, that's not a feature. That's just something that you need to do to get on ops or make our deployments easier. That falls to the DevOps team. The DevOps team can do that. So we quickly started seeing that team scope start creeping larger and larger, as well as the engineer's team size start growing larger and larger, where it was too large for a single manager to maintain 
and no one could keep up with what everyone else was working on on the team. So we reevaluated and looked at that and decided, how can we better split this up to serve the actual demands and, cheat and achieve this change we were wanting to go? So instead of a DevOps team, we started building platform teams. What I mean by platform teams is each team had to define scope to deliver a product to our customers, and they were off that was known to deliver functionality internal to our customers that they needed. So how did we align and decide how what or needed a platform? Well, we aligned by internal products. I don't mean an AWS team. I mean a team that was supporting the platform that our application services ran on, or a team that does our CI CD that builds out the platform that pushes your code from an idea to production. Build out an observability platform team that builds out that toolbox for here's how we do metrics, here's how we do all the observable observability tools that you need so you know what's working in prod. So by having those products that are driven by your internal customers and users around the services required to build that, we could build out those core platform teams to help sol start solving those real problems. How do we handle the scale and the, the engineer creep of those teams? Well, we made sure not by any mandate, just by the actual efficiency of the team, it's kind of fell down to the whole two pizza team size. So we had engineers that were about seven to eight people per team, large enough that if you had a team lunch, everyone could sit at a table and have a conversation with each other. But that wasn't a mandate or anything like that. We found out just through natural workloads and through the engineers that when we got too large, things started falling through the crack. It was hard to keep up with whatever everyone was doing. So by having those smaller teams, we were able to kind of better know what each other were doing on the teams as well as stay on top of the work that was coming in. So to recap, we first solved those problems of who's gonna do the work by instead of having one bucket team that does all the DevOps, by focusing on specific platform teams that have defined criteria of what they work on and are tightly scoped in scale and engineers to make sure that they can keep those running. So the next lesson we had now that we had these teams that are dedicated that are doing the work is how do people know what they're doing? That's the key problem lots of engineers run into is, A, how do your customers know? How do engineers know? How does leadership know what you're actually doing? Because if you don't have a, a C-level that's coming down with a mandate that's saying we're doing this, your teams need to be the ones that are trying to get that C-level and those engineers to go, yeah, I want to follow you down that path. That path seems really exciting. How do you do that? Well, those teams had that internal vision before of what they needed to do. They talked to the engineers. We were much smaller at the time when we started, so we had an idea of what the problem space was that we needed to solve. The problem was is that vision stayed internal to those teams. So what we really, need, really needed to do was create an external vision for those teams. And by an external vision, I mean take what is in your head and make sure that it's available to everyone else that might be a new engineer coming to your team or a new engineer joining your company, or even better, the C-level CTO who you might need to convince, hey, this need, we're not getting traction, this is really important, and show him why that's important. So how did we actually transfer that internal vision to an external vision? First off, we set up team charters. We made sure teams wrote down on public documentation what was the scope of the team, how the team communicated, how if you needed work or you wanted to interact with that team, how to go about that, but more importantly, what the team didn't do. Then that gives us a point in time to tell people, oh, if you, need to, if you need help with your deployments or your observability or whatever other platform, you could point them to that specific platform team. That got us out, got us out of that catch-all one team where everyone just goes and goes, well, you're the DevOps team, so I'm just gonna come to you and get my DevOps, where we could say, no, we're glad to help you, but you need to talk to these people over here. The other thing was that as we started building out projects and work that we were going to do to solve these problems, we needed people to know what those projects were, what we were looking to deliver, and more importantly, what they could expect as the end result. To do that, we needed to have public project plans, project manifestos, project documents, whatever you want to call them, but just have a public written down form that says, we're going to solve this problem, here's how we're planning on doing it, here's kind of what we're expecting you to do to be able to use this, and here's what the end result looks like. Now, ideally, you do those as early in the process as you're talking to your users of solving those problems, 
That way you can have a collaborative document because you don't want to have it where no one knows what you're actually working on or even worse, you build something out and they disagree with how it's solving the problem. And then the final thing is those of you that use AWS and some of the services might notice they've started making their roadmaps for their services team public on GitHub. This is great. It allows you to know what's upcoming in those services you use. We do the same thing internally with our teams. We have roadmaps that scale out for one and a half years all the way down to quarters and then just two real-time backlogs. But these roadmaps aren't rigid where it's saying, we're committing to do this thing that we said we're going to do one and a half years from now because our customers could change, our landscape could change. We might change how we're doing business. So what you need to have is that flexibility in there and by having those kind of long-term visions that are then divvied up into smaller chunks that are in more real time, allows you to commit to projects that you're going to deliver to your customers so they know and expect what's going to come, while at the same time giving people that high level, big picture direction that more of your upper management and your C-levels might actually need so they can get on board with you. So to recap, once we had the teams that were doing the work, we needed people to know what work they're wanting, they're looking to do and how they're looking to do that. So we solved that problem by having those teams create public external visions of what they're currently doing, what they're looking to do, and more importantly, what's the scope of their team. So next up, lesson three was, once we had those project plans and those roadmaps, how do we fill them out? So as we started filling them out early on, we we're always like, hey, there's a problem we have. Kubernetes could solve that, or AWS could solve that, or the latest shiny new tech could solve every problem we wanted to have. So we started chasing down shiny new techs and going, hey, yeah, that's going to solve all our problems. Oh, wait, we have to do X, Y, and Z for us to even first be able to use that? Well, that might not work. Well, what about this over here? Oh, well, we have to do that? Okay. So we were starting in the problem where we were jumping and chasing a bunch of shiny new tech instead of what we needed to focus on was making sure we're using the right new tech. And what do I mean by the right new tech? I mean the tech that more importantly actually solves the problems that your, those platform teams are looking to solve. Lots of problems can still be solved by Bash and Jenkins. It might not necessarily be the best solution, but it might be the best solution for you. It doesn't necessarily need to be solved by the most complicated Kubernetes deployment structure infrastructure out there. Sometimes it's more important to know what the right tech for your situation is. So how do you know what that right tech actually is? First off, context rules everything around me. So how do you know what's the right tech? Context. Without contextual information, you don't know what's the right tool. So what's that contextual information? Maybe it's how much, how much time you have engineer-wise to dedicate to a project. Maybe it is how much work is it going to take to get to that point. Do we have the skill necessary or can we get the skills necessary to achieve that end project that we're looking for? A, does it even solve problems we're looking to solve or is it just a shiny new thing that allows us to write cool blog posts to give conference talks? So with that contextual information, you could determine whether or not something is just shiny new tech or the right shiny new tech. And then also with that context, you need to focus on making sure that you're actually choosing things that are helping solve your problems over just giving you hype and street cred in the tech scene. So we made the same mistake where we chased hype shiny new projects and then we ended up not solving problems that we needed to really solve. So we had to reevaluate and focus on what problems are we actually solving and is this tool actually solving those? Now at the same time, when I'm talking about making sure you're using the right new tech, the right new tech might be the tech you're using today, but it might not. Don't fear the sunk cost of the existing technology you have if your context, contextual information tells you that it's a better choice to move to something else. Change is going to happen, like I said, so you need to make sure that you're changing at the appropriate time with the appropriate tools. So definitely don't fear having to change just because you have a tool that solves the problem, kind of. So to recap, context is king. Context is everything. Without context of your company, how your company works,
the problem space you work in and how your engineers solve problems, you can't pick the right technology to solve your problems. And if you choose just based upon blog posts, conference talks, or whatever is getting the most traction on Twitter or GitHub stars, you're going to be choosing technologies constantly and jumping around. And usually that's not going to make fun for anyone. <laughs> so the fourth lesson we ran into as we're going around this is now that we kind of had an idea of the right technology we needed to ship to our engineers to solve these problems, what do we actually do and how do we get it so they can use those problems and get those products, solve those problems? So the first way we kind of started out is how a lot of people traditionally ship software. We went away off, did our thing, we talked to them early on, we got our requirements, we talked, thought we knew what systems that they needed to get fixed, we went off, we built it, we came back to them, maybe, maybe a couple sprints later, maybe it was months later, maybe even worse off, it was a year later, and we came back to them and said, we built you this Kubernetes cluster. And they come back and go, oh, well, we don't need containers today anymore. We have these bigger problems we need to worry about. So you spend a year building all the stuff that isn't solving a problem. Or maybe it was you went and you're like, oh, yeah, that problem with all those users getting bad Unicode in the, in the usernames, we fixed that bug with this problem. They go, oh, all that work you spent fixing it there? We just sanitized it on the UI and fixed it on the front end. It was a two-point story for us to get that out the door. And so by going away, building it, and coming back, we ended up solving problems that weren't the problems of today. We were solving the problems of yesterday and causing ourselves to do a lot of extra work. So essentially, once we came back and built it, the engineers essentially just were like, cool, you did some work, shrug, maybe we might use that in the future. But really what they were telling us was, one, what value are, all, are you actually giving us as your team? And are you doing anything that's making my day better and making it so I can achieve my goals faster? So how did we get it so we were actually making it where we were solving today's problems instead of chasing yesterday's problems? First off, that came from realizing that we always needed to be shipping. So always be shipping. Going through and making sure we're delivering value to those teams means building an iterative product, an iterative platform, something that we can easily add features to, work on without breaking everything else. So that means getting out the, the mindset of, I get my requirements, I go to my engineers, we work on it for six months, we come back. It might mean, hey, Here's an idea of what we're trying to solve. Go back, build out a prototype, come to them and say, hey, here's this prototype. Give me some feedback. Let me know what's working like. How's the inputs looking? Is that kind of still what you're thinking about needing to do? Does the results look and match up what you need to do? And so just always keep iterating on those products and making sure you're in constant communication with your customers and users about the problems you're solving. I know my team as Infra engineers, we have a tendency to think we know all the problems and we can just solve all the problems of the company. But unfortunately, we don't always know all the problems. We need to talk to those software engineers, those analysts, those analytics folks that are trying to solve the same problems of the business and talk to them and go, how can we actually make your job easier today and work with them to make sure that's a case? We also needed to get out of the mindset of perfection and quit chasing perfection because as is mentioned earlier, code is never going to be perfect. There's always going to be issues with code. And so it's more important to focus on solving 80, 85, 90% of the problems for that your engineers are currently expecting rather than holding away for an extra weeks, months, never to get it where it's 100% perfect. It's much better to iterate, ship something that's practical, that's solving today's problems, rather than focus on something that is perfect and you're sitting there always waiting. So as we kind of went around this and figured out how we could solve these problems, what we needed to do was instill this into a little bit kind of very simple run book of how we actually solve this. First off, find those excited users. They might be excited or they could be angry, but those are your users. <laughs> find people that have a problem that you can fix, you need to fix, and that is available and ready for you to work with. Give them a solution, a product, a service, a tool, whatever that might solve an initial part of that problem. 
listen to them complain about it because it's not going to be perfect and they will have lots of complaints. Fix those complaints, repeat as necessary. So keep running through that and that's how you'll actually be able to solve today's problems as we do instead of chasing the problems of yesterday. So to recap, the biggest thing we needed to focus on as our teams, once we determined we had teams, we knew what to work on and we knew what was available, we had to make sure we were solving the problems of today by delivering an iterative product and constantly talking to our customers. Without that constant communication and that constant deliverable, we, were never, we wouldn't, would not have been able to achieve the pace that we could solve today's problems. We would have constantly been fighting fires in combination of delivering products solving yesterday's problems. So the fifth and final lesson for today that we ran into was how do we actually get this system that we built out to scale up and to the right? <laughs> we got it kind of working for these internal platform teams, but as I said earlier, we wanted to improve the happiness not of just our engineers that are trying to ship new technology, new services, or anything like that. We also wanted to improve the happiness of the engineers on those platform teams. We don't want to just flood them in toil where they're constantly taking request tickets or human chat ops or anything like that. So how do we scale this so actual engineers can service themselves? So we started off with this problem of how can we do this by, as most people do, we wrote a bunch of bash. We took a bunch of random bash scripts some might have SSH'd into boxes and things like that. And we just wrapped a nice shiny new bash layer on top of it and said, here's your one interface to build everything you need. And it would work once out of every 10 times, maybe once every five if you're lucky. So we had this problem of basically trying to shove square pegs into round holes. And we were like, how can this be better? We can't actually give this to people and say, Hey, yeah, your life's going to be so much easier. Run this tool that works maybe less frequently than you would actually expect. So how do we actually go about that? We had to make square holes. We had to <laughs> cut out those round pegs and make them square holes so we could put the square pegs in there. And we did that by building common interfaces. And what do I mean by common interfaces? Well, that bash was turned into maybe it could be actual API calls to the devices it's interacting with. Or maybe we could build out Terraform modules and have things defined in Terraform that is a common interface out there. Or even better, instead of someone running a bash script on their laptop, maybe it's an API service that then has interfaces for a chatbot or a curl or whatever tool that they want to do to interact with that. So we started building out these common interfaces to the problem so that way uh, it was easier for engineers to actually self-service and we could actually more easily build out air handling and better integrate those various bits. So as we built out those common interfaces, what we also were able to achieve is under the hood, implementing everyone's least favorite thing, standards and practices. <laughs> we we're able to actually implement naming standards, tagging standards. Oh, you want your database to be called something like this? Oh, it's a standard because you don't really pick. It's just the tool decides based upon the information passed in how, you, how the internals of the system that you don't necessarily need or should care about work because they're the, provided to you by a system. So we were able to abstract out those questions of like, well, what do I call my database user? Or what do I call this? What port do I run this on? We abstracted all that out by building those common interfaces so that way you're passing in maybe four attributes and then based upon those four attributes, we can infer the rest of the system. We also were able to build out better practices around how we actually build out tools and what observability tools you get out of the box by having these because we were able to add features onto it under the hood without engineers having to change their interface. So they could be using the platform, signed up and be like, oh, whenever I need to do a new service, I just make a call or I fill out this JSON, YAML, this JSON file, this YAML file, whatever. And under the hood, they might get all the observability tools we offer for a new service with all its information pre-populated. They get any configs that they need set up automatically set up for them. The other key thing we had to do was documentation. And not documentation after the fact where you just kind of 
throw a blurb up there of why your tool has a funny name that no one's going to understand or a picture that goes along with it, but documentation of why this actually works, how it works, the problem it's trying to solve, how to get help when it doesn't work, and more importantly, how to contribute. The biggest thing we needed with documentation was dev setups and how to contribute because that then made engineers feel like, oh, I need a new feature for this. Oh, it tells me how I can set up a dev environment and add the feature that I need. We started then getting pull requests and people coming to us instead of us just instantly going, oh yeah, we'll take that ticket to add this feature here. People started making pull requests to add their own functionality. So then it started becoming a community effort that we ran to grow those systems so we were able to scale them out. We also needed to focus on reducing the number of handoffs and transactions that were going between getting something out, getting something deployed, or anything. We wanted to reduce as much human interaction as possible. So we wanted to build automated checks, automated compliance re requests, where if you had a pull request and its checks were green, its unit tests passed, things like that, we could then basically accept it and say, we do a code review, this looks good, it's out the door, instead of someone going, all right, I code reviewed that, looks good, now let me go kick off this staging test, now let me wait for this to run, all right, now I need to manually run this linter, now I need to do all these other manual steps, make them as automated checks on the PR, so that way instantly someone could just look at the PR and go, oh, it's green, okay, now I just need to review the functionality and what this is actually doing, rather than the, oh, well, you didn't put a new line there, or your braces don't line up, things like that, because humans don't want to do that. Computers are great for that. The other thing we did to get people to understand what these platforms were provided, but also get people interested in working with them, more information about that, was set up a notion of office hours, where teams go and sit in like our public kitchen or set up a meeting room, and they make them, they make either one or two representatives from their team available for anyone to kind of walk in and ask questions off the street. The idea there is that it's a custom, customer driven interaction. So the customer could come in and say, I'm experiencing this problem today, can you help me fix this? I need to get this fixed. Or the customer could come in and say, hey, that was really slick, that new thing you added, how'd you go about adding that and get talked through? Now, of course, we do these weekly, we don't have them set up Daily, weekly works out pretty well for us. We also have a setup that we did where we called it our solutions office hours where it's our architect and our principal software engineers and then a handful of people from our various observability team, technical operation teams and myself that can sit there as consultants. So if someone has a new idea that they might be like, this could be really helpful for us to solve this problem they can come there early on and run their idea by this essential internal group of internal consultants and get feedback and say, hey, that's a good idea, have you thought about this? Or that's a really great idea, could we also use it for this? So by doing those office hours, we were able to grow that community interaction. So to recap, we scaled by building standard self-service interfaces and reaching out to the community via documentation and those open office hours. And by doing that, that allowed us to get out of the day-to-day -day toil of a lot of these platforms and make it where engineers could solve their own problems. So to recap, I went over about five key lessons that Anova learned as we we're going over this journey. And we started out by making sure we were building the correct teams to solve these problems by focusing on teams that deliver a consistent and thorough platform to our customers. We focused on making sure that those visions of those teams were publicly documented, publicly shared, and more importantly, known throughout the company. We then made sure to focus on context because without context, you don't know anything that's going on. We also made sure to constantly be delivering product and value to our customers because without that, we were chasing the problems of yesterday instead of solving the problems of today. And then we were constantly scaling and made this a process that anyone can do by ensuring we have correct documentation, self-service interfaces, and reducing the amount of humans in the process. Thank you, that's all the, all the slides I have. I'm Kevin Harris, if you have any questions, I'll be outside.